Good afternoon, Justin. It's so nice to see you on this Saturday. Um, how are you today? Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm doing really well. It's uh, a little stormy today in Palm Bluff, and um, I woke up feeling pretty good. And I'm just looking forward to what the day brings in this, uh, this interview. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I, I had to look outside too. I think it's not quite stormy here yet, but it's not as sunshiny as it's been the last few days. However, I think that we're both trying to bring some sunshininess with our wardrobes. I love your floral element. I'm trying with the hot pink to match you. Um, I think we're going to make it sunshiny if it's not already, right? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Yes, that's the spirit. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you and I'm so thankful that you would take the time today. So for anyone who doesn't know you, this is Justin Thomason, um, artist extraordinaire from Pine Bluff area of Arkansas. And I can't wait to learn more about your story today and your work and what motivates you. So um, we'll just dive in. So where we usually get started is a individual's you know, personal background, where their art interest kind of fit into their story. Could you tell us about Justin, growing up, what were you like? What did you play with? What did you think about? Paint the picture, so to say. Well, it's been such a journey as an artist seeing myself develop. Uh, I started off at the age of three, around three when I could first like hold a pencil really, or a crayon. And I would start off like just drawing on walls, paper, whatever I can get my hands on to, just doing anything that's art related. I always felt that, you know, that I was an artist in the spirit. and. Uh, I always would, would make certain things and, and the images I would create would be like like pictures of like a family of lions or, or like a ninja or something like that, like things that I really like, you know. So uh, from that point on, I developed my craft more and more as I grow older, as I grew older, um, I started using more forms of medium. So I started with pencil and crayons that I gravitated towards ink and pens. Then yeah, soon I, I started working with color pencils in a more realistic fashion when I, once I began to go to high school because um, I had a teacher to motivate me and inspire me to do so because uh, she seen so much potential in my work. And she was wondering, you know, uh, if I could, could do the style of realism. So she uh, she challenged me to do that. And um, I proudly took the paper. It was like the first, like the biggest project I worked on since like junior high. And like, it was like, um, like 20 by 24 by 30, 24 by 30 canvas. And she had challenged me, my, my teacher, Miss Himes in high school, she challenged me to do a photorealism picture. And I had no idea how it was going to turn out. But I worked with it. I stuck with it for a while, for two weeks. I stressed and strained. And um, when I got finished, I was really proud of the results. I didn't know I could do something like that myself. Like the work was, was really well. It turned out really well. And I actually followed a, a method, a grid method to create the piece. And uh, they opened my mind a lot more to, to the world of art, to the limits it can go to, you know. And um, from that point on, and from the, that point in high school, really, I began to enter a lot of competitions and began to put my work in different shows in the Arts and Science Center. Um, where else? The, the Simmons Bank. Um, it's, it's, it's a few more places. Uh, the UAPB Incubator, the Clinton Library. And um, I've entered challenges at AYAA, the Omega Sci-Fi talent hunt district. I was the first place winner for two years. Uh, winning AYAA, the on-site competition, first place. Um, the newcomers competition, first place. I have so many different trophies and racks. And uh, having, I started winning competitions when I was in, in elementary school, actually. You know, um, I won my first art competition when I was, uh, it was like a coloring competition for the military. And wow. I did that, they presented me with an award. That's so that just always drove me to do it. Yeah, I love how you can trace back to that one canvas that the teacher encouraged you to do this photorealism project, right? The 24 by 30 or whatever it was um, thing. I'm, I'm making me curious. Do you remember what the, the drawing was of? Like, what was that first project on that canvas? Oh, yeah, definitely. It was a, a picture of like a Pakistan Pakistani guy I yeah. got from a, a National Geographic book. And I done it all with color pencils, and then we made it so such a strong piece with the fact the eyes was very like luminescent. They they kind of blew up a little bit, like they had really strong color contrast in the eyes. You can see it's all like all kind of oranges and like yeah, like a yellow ocher color in his eyes with a like a brownish burnt umber in his eyes, and it really worked well. People love that piece. I can imagine that eyes must be such a difficult part to get right, but such an impactful part 
of a photorealistic um, work, right? Eyes tell us so much about a person maybe, or just like the humanity is all wrapped up in, in the eyes maybe. I don't know, that's how I'm thinking about it right now. Yeah, they definitely say the eyes are the window to the soul. So. That is true. That is the, the, the phrase that we go by. So you've mentioned this phrase, um, photorealism um, a couple of times, and I would love to understand more um, from your perspective of what that means exactly. Like I can guess from the term, but I'm not, I'm not an expert. Uh, so the term photorealism mean is basically just, um, <clears throat> you know, as it, as it's, uh, as it, what it reads, you know, it's like you use a photo and you're trying to copy the photo exactly what it is, make it most realistic as possible. So that's basically what the style of photorealism is. And, um, you know, my style more have gravitated towards contemporary work and uh, just realism in general as time progressed. But that's, that was my starting point. That's so cool. Um, and it's, I think so many times I hear that like a teacher is that first motivator, right? Someone who you can regard as having some sort of expertise um, who sees that in you too is, is a great motivator um, and inspiration to keep trying with the thing that you're gifted at. So that's so cool that that's part of your story. So you had this teacher in high school, I think it was, is that what you said? Um, and then um, you had this idea that you wanted to pursue art. What did you do from there? Did you end up continuing like a with formal education? Did you go um, apprentice different artists? What was the next step? Well, um, so at first I initially didn't want to go to college because I feel like I had skills that could take me further than a place, you know, other than college. So um, I was working on this invention with my friend and uh, we were working on the invention for a while until like we kind of hit a, a wall with it. And that was because we needed funding for the project. Like we made a prototype and everything. So we hit a wall. So I, I, I immediately thought that I need to make a, a plan B. And my plan was to go to college. So I found a lot of different scholarships, apply for those, I apply for UAPB. And so there I was a freshman at UAPB. And uh, from that point on, I continued to work with my career as an artist and I had so much support that really helped me out in my career. You know, not just my teacher, uh, Virginia Holmes helped me. I also had uh, another teacher, Ms. Combs, uh, Mr. Horton, um, Jeffrey Puyo, Jimmy Cunningham. It was so many different people along the way who just really helped me out. And uh, that really made a big impact on my life as an artist to see those people who came before me who could tell me and I could learn from them. And mm -hmm. so um, once I started working um, in, in my freshman year as an artist, uh, I got a commission from the school to do a piece for the for the writer, the infamous writer, Terry McMillian. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote many different books. And um, I was able to present her with that piece on stage and she began crying. And that really was a a great moment for me. I felt really accomplished at that at that time because I never had done anything like that before. And um, that really kind of just opened my eye even more towards the possibilities of, of my artwork. Wow, what a great um, memory and experience to have got to, to have um, as you were honing your craft in school. I imagine it's like, you know, one level of receiving the, the award is um, an affirmation of all of the talent and skill you already possess. And then it's also kind of like propelling you to be like, all right, I'm going to step further into what's uncomfortable or what's new or what's different and keep um, growing because I have this community support or like proof that I, I am um, doing this thing and doing it well. Um, so that, that's really special. So you went to um, school in, in Pine Bluff. Are you currently in Pine Bluff now too? That's been an important place in your life. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm I've uh, been born and raised in Palm Bluff. Uh, Palm Bluff is a very simple city. It's not much here. It's not much opportunity. But I feel like, you know, it, a place is wherever you make it. You know, you can make your home uh, anywhere. I find Palm Bluff to be my home. And um, I found a, a lot of good people to reach out and support me. So I can't say that they haven't been rewarded for me. And um, that kind of puts me in mind of another experience where you uh, mentioned um, apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. I've actually had, I started one apprenticeship in my freshman year in college where I was working, where I had the chance to work with a master artist. And uh, his name is Henry P. Linton. He have a, um, a prize from the Congress office in Washington for his artwork. He's like in a hall of fame of artists. He's received so many different awards. He's, uh, he's also a historian. He collects so many books on African-American literature and culture. 
and art. And he does so many different things. Like he's an amazing guy. And uh, so I had the opportunity to work with him on a, a 48 foot mural and it's 10 foot tall. It's currently right now in the Sarasota Casino. It was a, a commission to us by the Paw Paw Nation. And um, it took us nine months to complete that piece. Wow. It's a really huge piece. It was so much hard work, so much pain. It seemed like it was never ended. I thought it would never end. But <laughs> once the day it was ended, it was, it was just a, such a glorious day because it just showed how much I can accomplish, you know, working with someone else. And I learned so much from him. That, that's, they'll always stick with me. Like a lot of artists, you know, come from Henry Linton's teachings. Like he was a, a teacher at UAPB at one point. He was the director of the art department. Mm -hmm. And I just feel so honored to, to be able to work with him because not everyone was able to work with him that was my age because he was like one of those old classic teachers that uh, no one would ever just really get a chance to work with because they all retired now or either, you know, died. So mm -hmm. it, was really, it was really cool that I had the chance to work with him. And to this day, I still communicate with him. Very, you know, we have a very close, strong connection. Um, I still do different little things to work with him. Currently, he's uh, working on the museum, and I've worked with him on that. Wow. So I've been learning that. There's been so many different things. And uh, Mr. Lynn, he's just such a great guy, really such a great guy. Yeah, that's so cool. And we will pull up that piece later to show, like, that um, the dimensions are wild, that, like, 48 feet or um, whatever. I can understand why it would take nine months. But I also think it's so meaningful the way that you do – recognize all of these people who have been along the way, like specifically by name, not just teachers in general, like really people whose lives have shaped yours and like whose knowledge you'll be able to pour out into your work and to inspire the next generation. I think recognizing those links makes a big difference, right? For us and for um, how we understand even ourselves and our styles as they develop. Um, you also mentioned, you know, like like different sources of, of inspiration and um, these apprenticeships, um, I'm sure, and it sounds like are an important part of that inspiration. I also remember as we were getting to know each other, you talked about motive, being motivated by family, um, the music of Kendrick Lamar. Like, can you speak about, you know, what gets you in the zone of like making and what you think about? Oh yeah, definitely. See, for me, art is just such a, I'm so passionate about it. It's almost kind of like ritualistic once I, once I start a piece because I have to lay down the paper, find all my materials, put them in order, arrange the colors, arrange the easel, and and the color palette, it's just so amazing to me. And uh, that right there, it just like, it kind of puts me in that mode, that mindset, that zone doing that. And um, it just really uh, just, just puts me in a different world as an artist. And um, I mentioned to you uh, that Kendrick Lamar was one of my favorite rappers. Mm -hmm. And he was like one of my biggest inspirations growing up. I could have sworn I've listened to every single one of his albums like over and over and over and over and over. And that really has shaped my, my world as an artist. Like it's really um, opened my eye to see a lot of things in a different way, you know, being a black artist in America and uh, giving opportunities granted to me that may not be often granted to a lot of people. So that make me so much more appreciative of where I come from and all the people that's around me. And that's going back towards my family. So, you know, growing up, uh, I was raised with a single mom and uh, she really had worked hard to, to, to raise her children. She had four children. And um, I recently had one brother to die of COVID. You know, he was 25 years old only. And it was really, life changing experience for me and the entire family. Because when, when you lose a family member, it really kind of, it, you know, things become so much more different. The dynamic is completely different. Now you have to work on without that person. Right. That was like such a strong part. And uh, from that day on, like things have changed, but my mom, she has been such a great mom. Like she's done whatever she could to help me. On my journey, she would go broke, help me. It's like now it's up to a point where I don't have to worry about that no more because I'm in a better place with my artwork. It's like now I have so many different commissions. I have nothing to worry about. You know, I have so many different things going on at once. I have nothing to worry about. And I'm just really appreciative, appreciative for that. And just seeing my family in the circumstances I know I've come from, it really motivate me like a lot to do much better and try that much harder so I can give back to them. You know, I want to give back to my grandma, my grandparents, my brothers, 
everyone that's around me, all my closest friends. So mm -hmm. to put them in that same position, to share that experience, to share with different content creators, everyone that I know along the way who helped me. And that's how I see it. That's me paying my debt off to those who helped me be in a position that I want to be. Yeah. Oh, that's so powerful. I so admire the network that you have surrounded yourself with um, and the ways that, you know, you've um, um, given them a chance to pour into you. And then you've been able to now like return that, you know, sevenfold or however much. I think that's really um, something to be so um, proud of in like how you use this art um, to facilitate like wins for everybody, right? Like, and um, inspiration for everyone. That is amazing. That's so good. Um, I don't want to miss the opportunity to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So you mentioned Kendrick Lamar's music, like listening to like almost every, if not every album multiple times. Is there a lyric off the top of your head that's like very meaningful to you or that like comes to mind? I don't even I don't know what's going to come out of your head because I don't even know if I know like which songs are Kendrick Lamar's. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> Well, so when you mentioned that, uh, two songs came to mind, Be Humble. That's that's definitely one of the songs that I feel like that definitely most resonates with me is when you say sit down and be humble. Because no matter how far you go, you you always have to remain that level of humility. That's the only way you will ever grow in what you do. You yeah. can't walk around with a big head because there's always someone who can do what you can do, but better. Mm -hmm. So you, you just got to see it in that light and stay and don't compare yourself to no one else. Always stay true to yourself and what you do. You know, you, everyone's on their own individual journey. So you have to see yourself as an individual working on, on your own individual path versus you trying to compare yourself to someone else and align yourself with their path that may be so much different from your own. And another song is um, No More Parties in LA. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like very line. curious now <laughs> yeah it was um, a line that said there's no place there was there's there's no um there's nowhere too far to be a star and um that line really it really touched me because i recently just i always wanted to go to los angeles mm -hmm. and do some art up there and i recently just had the chance to, to go to los angeles for like a whole month and i, I currently have artwork up there and i'm going to be having in the, in the art display in a place called artistry Wow. It's an art gallery. So that really is just so cool to see that that dream starting to manifest and unfold. And I have friends up there as well that's working on getting some murals and different things done as, down there. So I'm, I'll probably be taking another trip up there pretty soon. So, and that's just really, just a, a really beautiful thing to see those kind of things unfold and manifest in my life. That's amazing. I think those two songs too are such a beautiful pairing, right? Of this balance of humility and also chasing after dreams and recognizing that we are each deserve to have dreams to chase, chase after, right? That that's valid and that's good and that's important. I think that duality that you um, manage and are mindful of is so important to how you show up to the world. So you talked about, um, you know, getting into the zone of the art, right? Laying out the different materials, like setting up the canvas and everything. I think that's a cool segue to just understand more about your style and your approach to your work. Um, I'm thinking as far as like, even like idea formation, right? Like, are you in front of the canvas when you get the idea? Do you have the idea first and then you go to make it? Like, what is this like for you? So um, I often premeditate my plans. I'll first sit down for a while, and meditate on them, think about it, draw it out, make a few sketches. And then once I do that, I'll decide on the style I want to do the piece in, I'll decide on color schemes and different things like that. So after that, I'll go on a little Easter egg search, find all my materials, go around asking different people with this and that, getting all the best information I can to make this piece the best as I can and execute it the way I want. How like I want to look exactly how I envisioned it to look. So uh, I do that, I gather all my materials. I have to go, go down to Mr. Lynn's shop, ask him for something, go to the art department, ask them for a few things. And they'll lend me some, uh, a few tools and objects that help me along my path of creating this piece. And uh, once I do that, I'll create my whole setup. I have to find a place to work because I often change a lot of places where I work because it's just the nature of art for me, you know, like wherever I get like the best vibes at, that's why I often work, you know? <laughs> so um, I'll just do that. I'll set up where I'm working. I'll play, lay down the plastic, uh, you know, set up my easel and canvas lay out my palette, have my colors um, arranged and um, how I plan to use them. 
often uh, I, I work from darks to lights. So it means like the shadows, the mid-tones, and the highlights. So that's how I often uh, lay out my palettes. And um, that's, uh, that's that. And I also um, like to put on music when I start doing artwork and just stand and look at the canvas for a while to kind of visualize everything that I'll be putting on there. And so once I do that for a while, I just sit back, kind of just feel it, take it all in. I just get into it, start painting and drawing. I first draw it out and I put like a layer of fixative on and I, I paint over that and just paint, 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 paint layers. I can be painting for hours and wow. then Eventually, it will just it'll start to shape up, mm-hmm. and uh, I leave it, maybe get something to eat, and come back to it, start painting even more. And the more I do that, the more it develops, and the more I get that more urge to want to finish it more to see this finished piece. Mm-hmm. So as that goes on, I constantly work, and it's finally it's finished. And once it's finished, it just you have this, this piece. It feels like a grand prize because you, you you did this, you accomplished it, and you just get like that. They're like release of, of like dopamine in your brain from just that success of finishing that piece. For sure. Oh, that's awesome. So it sounds like you have like, um, you're sort of like a nomadic artist, like with this willingness to not be like hunkered down in one studio, right? But kind of on the go to wherever is the best fit. Does that translate to your materials too? I know you talked about going on like a sort of egg hunt to find the things you need or the information you need. Do you stick with a certain type of paint, like a certain type of canvas, or is that more fluid, like a certain color scheme? I don't know. I just um, I'm curious about that. Well, um, I particularly uh, like to work on panel boards. My it all my, my canvas often varies though because I work on canvas, uh, panel boards, cardstock paper, a lot of different things. Honestly, y'all, a lot of different things. Like yesterday. Um, I got finished doing a Valentine's Day card for someone on like a, a big poster board. And that was just like a simple project, you know, it, it'd be projects on top of projects. And I worked on gourds before I painted on top of gourds, like a lot of different things, materials. And um, as far as colors, I choose a lot of like, um, kind of what's the word? Like, uh, I like vibrant colors, a lot of highly saturated vibrant colors. I like uh, a lot of contrast in colors as well. So I like the, to mix things like um, like have like a blue beside orange because they'll really pop. Like as you can see with my, my jacket. Yes. <laughs> I love those type of colors because they're kind of like flamboyant in a way. Mm-hmm. Very beautiful colors. They kind of give you like a sense of of, uh, of euphoria or a dream like this. You know what I mean? Yes, what a mood that is. And I can totally see what you're talking about and other people will be able to see it too when we pull up your work. Um, That's such a cool way to describe it. So thank you for for making sense of that for me. So um, you have this process, you make the works, and then um, it seems like in your story, these competitions, these collaborations are are really important. I, I think it's helpful insight for people who maybe are hoping to get started too, to know like, how do you choose the competitions that you're part of? How do you like search them to even know what you could possibly apply to? Um, and how early on did you start doing that? What has that been like um, in your journey? Well, um, I started doing that in high school with more official competitions. It started off with me just really just, you know, competing with my friends in class, drawing or something. Mm-hmm. And um, from that point on, I've just gotten more serious with competitions. And um, as far as finding competitions, will be best for you, best fitting. You find uh, whatever which fits the category of your work. So if you create contemporary work, you'll want to enter a category with contemporary work. Or if you're an acrylic painter, you know, enter a category with acrylic paints. And also uh, demographic supply. So you have to you have to be mindful of, of where are you. You know, if it's only for a certain group of people, because it's different. You know, art competitions is only for like maybe like a religious group or something like that. Mm-hmm. or an ethnic group or something like that. So you have to be mindful of those different things. You know, shipping, the price of the competition, it, it's all different kind of competition. You can end up with a, a competition that's free or one that can cost you like $100 to answer. So it's all different kinds of ways of looking at it. And it's also a, a prize after every competition. So you, you get a trophy or, or award or your name will be placed in a book or something like that. So it's always rewarding, you know, that comes with competitions. That's the, you know, the benefit. And uh, another thing that's good to put on your on your resume as well, competitions. The more you have that on your resume, the more likely you are to, to get commissions and, and more work. And you network out with people and things like competitions as well and collaborative uh, 
collaborative projects. Like um, I'm currently working on a, a project with, uh, with Mark Keith. And, uh, you know, Art, Mark Keith Wood, that's another artist out of Fayetteville. He's from Pablo, Arkansas. He's mm -hmm. currently residing in Fayetteville. And uh, I'm, I'm working on a, a project with him. There's like four giant paintings and there's like three smaller paintings with it that's still pretty big. So that's a collaborative project we're doing. And that right there, that opens so many doors because now people, they see me with his work, they make that connection. So once they reach out to him, they'll also reach out to me for that work as well. And if they, those pieces are on exhibit, that's also my exhibit as well. And people see that work of that magnitude and they'll be impressed by that. So they make really good for a portfolio, just networking and expanding, reaching out even further because it's like one opportunity brings another. It's like a domino effect. So valid. Um, I am thinking about, so my background was in marketing before I switched to social work. And we thought about, you know, when brands partnered together, right? And this is kind of like, like when artists partnered together, right? Your stories kind of become intertwined in the public knowledge, right? In the narrative of the arts world. When you are um, contemplating, you know, becoming a collaborator with someone for a project, um, you know, what matters to you in that other artist? Like, is it, you know, they, are you thinking about their values? Are you thinking about their style? Are there th certain things that matter more to you than others when you're entering a new collaboration? Definitely. I feel like the, the most important thing when you um, start a project with another artist is you have to um, be mindful of their vision and their vision got to match your vision for the work. So there's a lot of communication that have to take place to act as that, that common ground for you two in order for this piece to be executed. So you have to think of like um, a placement of a lot of things in the composition because you may want something here and they may want something there. So yeah. you both will have to discuss what would be most effective for this piece, you know, rather than either one of us looking past both of the egos of the artists. So you have to, you have to do that and then find that common ground, you know, of where you want to work. And that's the only way you have to work as an artist, you know, and it, it all, it's always fun and rewarding. You learn so much working with different people and different things. And um, I just say that's the key part though, is communication when working with someone. Yeah, I feel like it comes back to being humble too, right? With the avoiding the egos um, clashing. Different. So there's something else I also want to speak on to it. Having an ego, that's never a good thing. It's never a good thing. Like it can, like I said, it can hinder you from learning. You can be so trapped in your ego and your own thoughts sometimes to the point you, you won't listen to what people are trying to tell you. It's like you block off information from learning because you think you know it all already. So it's always important as an artist to, to be able to learn, be open to learn and to know your place in the world. For so sure. it's always important. You've um, opened a cool door for me. Now I kind of want to know if there's um, you know an experience where you have had that kind of learning because you let down your ego or something like that that stands out where it was like, oh, wow, like I could be doing this totally differently. I don't know, any big ahas for you? Oh uh, yeah, it's been a lot of different things to teach me along my path as an artist because in high school, you know, I was, a, I was an artist and everyone acknowledged me as an artist in high school. Like everyone knew me and they came to me for work. Like I was doing all the t-shirts and artwork and stuff. And I'm like doing work for the city and different things like that as an artist. So like, I've needed those people along the path, like like Mr. Lynn. That was a really humbling experience for me because seeing him, he was like, he's a master artist and I was just like a starting off amateur compared to him. So seeing that, seeing someone make work that big and that dedicated while being like 70, 79 years old, like like that really moved me. Like like if he was doing that at that age and I'm just doing this, that made me look like, like a little speck, you know? Mm -hmm. So it like, that really humbled me right there with that. And it really uh, pushed me to, to want to do more bigger, ambitious things. And um, I've also had friends that have like more success in their career and different things like that. And they'll tell me that now that also kind of humbled me seeing that I can grow like that as well and be on that same, you know, level, but with my artwork. Yes, that's so cool. And I think that these collaborations are such a special way to recognize that you're part of this much bigger pond than your school or your university, right? We're in this world of artists and there's always something new, it seems like, to learn or to expand your repertoire. Um, it's all, it sounds very exciting. So um, without like making people wait any longer, I'd like to pull up your work so that we can actually see all the stuff we've been talking about. Um, so the first one here is the land of the Osage, right? And this is that big, um, 
like mural kind of project that we were talking about. Um, I, I just think the style is so cool and engaging and like so specific to the, um, the group that, that commissioned the work. Can you tell us more about what's going on here? Okay, so um, it's a panoramic view of the Arkansas River. And um, the whole thing was kind of to, to catch the natural beauty and scene and culture of, of that tribe. And it's also a, a collaboration with, with African culture as well. Because you, uh, you can see there's many African symbols in the sky if you were to zoom in close and see them. And there's also many African symbols on the, on the borders as well. It's uh, going up and down vertically. And um, also there's, there's swirls, giant swirls that kind of represent like the universe for, and for Native Americans. And uh, on the top and bottom, there's pottery that, uh, that symbolizes that, that culture for, for Native Americans as well. And there's different animals like, like eagles and um, lizards and different things like that just uh, around the picture too to kind of give you that feel for, for um, the nature and the, the biology that's around. It's so cool how it does capture so many elements of um, the lives and the cultures of the people in these areas near the Arkansas River. I'm curious about how early in the process were you involved? Like, were you in this collaboration when the call for, you know, pitches went out? Were you brought on later? What was that like? Well, um, I started off working on this project when he, um, when he first got the panel board, like I had to install the panel board with him, build the panel board up with him, sand the panel boards, put a layer of gesso on them and hang them up. And that's when we started painting. We started sketching on them, like from the very beginning. They came to him with the commission like like um, like a month before I came to the studio with him. And his son created uh, multiple digital sketches of how it would look. So um, that's how, how, how we kind of started with that. We kind of, he, he took different bits and pieces from those digital sketches and all implemented them in the, in the commission as a whole. And um, that's how this kind of came to be. And we worked, we thought of different things as we went and put that on the artwork. And that's yeah. how we kind of, you know, made that unfold. Yeah. How much direction was given to so the Osage Quapaw tribe, right? Was the, the commissioning like agent for this work? Is that right? Um, so the one who commissioned us was the, was the chief, the, uh, the chief of the tribe. He wanted, a he wanted a big mural in the casino, you know, to pay homage to his people. So, um, I feel he didn't, he didn't really just give too much direction with it. He just know he wanted a lot of different things to represent the tribe on there. So he kind of left us with a lot of freedom to kind of do what we wanted with it. And, um, he would just come in and out of the operation like every month or so, and, you know, and there was one moment where he, he came in and he, he was so impressed with what he's seen. He just offered, he was like, Hey, do you want a 25% bonus? Like out of nowhere, just got the kind of money to just say, you want a 25% bonus. So we took that. <laughs> and that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's so cool. You know, you're doing good work when randomly extra funding is offered to make it happen. That's so awesome. So I am, I'm a graduate assistant and I am in a, a multicultural center on campus and we do, you know, social media posts for cultures that are um, ones that I'm not an expert in. Right. And so even in those um, small things, like, like an Instagram post, there's so much research that's, that I have to do to understand, you know, what I'm doing and to do it from a place of, of cultural humility. What was it like? Did you go in knowing a lot about the Osage um, Quapaw tribe? Did you have to do a lot of learning in this process? Well, um, I came in knowing some, you know, some information. I came out a lot more knowledgeable of the culture, knowing what it means and understands like, uh, like it's arrowheads in South of the picture, like the arrowheads. That's something I, I've always looked at, but didn't take too deeply into consideration. Mm. And then to how important they were to the, the Native Americans, like those arrowheads was the same thing they used to not only hunt, but to like skin different clothing, to, to weave different things, to carve different patterns and different things like that. So this was not just a tool for hunting, it was like a, an essential tool for just living basically. Wow. And uh, like the river as well, like the river, that's the Arkansas River, that's what they lived off of basically. 
Like, um, I never just thought about that as well. Like, how does this river that I see so often going to Stuttgart and um, how this river really, like, saved some, like, people literally survived off of this river. I never thought about that. That's and, so um, cool how you get to um, use this experience to have a different appreciation for a place that you had thought, like, you knew really well, right? But now you got to understand through a different, like, lens. Um, it seems um, really special. Um, so you also mentioned there being some African symbols in here. Are those symbols, you know, related to the um, experiences of the indigenous people? Like what, uh, what sort of symbols were chosen? Well, um, the symbols that were chosen, we found them online and they all have different meanings that mean different things. Like, uh, for example, some, um, one of them, they all have different shapes and forms. I really can't just point them out from this picture, but one of them means harmony. One means love, one means God, you know, different little things like that. It, it, it basically kind of represents ethics of a village. Um, and then this, this picture as a whole is kind of like a tribute towards indigenous cultures. So that's why you have that partnership with Native Americans and African culture. And they want um, the project was to, to pay homage to those too that they made this undermined in the system today. So that's where we, uh, the focus were, was uh, intended you know, to, to capture. Yeah, I love that synchrony or that synergy um, is really powerful. So the next one here is Divine Windows. Um, I can't wait to hear more about what's going on, what inspired it, all that. Well, um, this is a more spiritual piece. It's uh, intended to give the, the viewer a feeling of like of heaven, like they're opening, they're looking into windows of heaven. And um, I want to use a cool color contrast, like as I mentioned earlier, I like to use a lot of strong color contrast and, sat and highly saturated colors, as you can see with the orange and the different various forms of blues. I also want to give a sense of, uh, of, of space and an open feel. As you can see with the, the trees, it's very, they're very spaced apart and they fade off into the distance as you, as you look backwards. I gave this piece to my grandmother as a gift and uh, it's currently right now in her house on display. <laughs> so um, that was just a really cool thing for me to do, in my opinion. I, I like, I love, you know, just giving these gifts. So I feel like that's the point of gifts is to give. So yeah. um, that's uh, that's currently the the position of this piece. <laughs> and this piece, it took me about about like two days to make. I really did this pretty fast. This um, I believe this is a. Um, a 20 by 24 canvas mm -hmm. that was done on. This is acrylic paint. The process I used to create that effect is uh, I would tape the picture, I will paint a layer first and I would tape and paint over the, 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 um, the space inside of the tape layer. And that's how I would create that uh, illusion like effect. That's so cool. And I can so picture um, like Justin's grandma. I'd be like, this is this awesome work, Divine Windows by my grandson. I'm so proud of him um, as she should be. But that's, um, it's so fun to give grandma's gifts, right? I love, <laughs> I love surprising my grandma. Um, they're like the best type people in my experience. So um, as I was reading about this work, I understand that the technique is from one of the people you've collaborated with, right? There was some sort of influence on the technique. Can you speak to that and why you wanted to um, maybe use that here? Um, yeah, this piece was uh, definitely inspired from uh, Henry Linton's style mm -hmm. and his work. Um, he used that same style with geometric shapes and uh, the different color schemes. And uh, working with him, it taught me that technique, actually. That's why I learned it from. And so now on, I put that, I, uh, I implement that technique with my works in the backgrounds of my works and those shapes, I change it. I change it up. I make my uh, my, my geometrical shapes more, um, I would say more randomly placed, more sporadic and, uh, and wild in a sense. But um, that's basically where I got the inspiration for them to create the, the piece in this style. And you will see that, that same type of, of of patterns through a, a lot of my works. Yeah, um, no, I love that. Thank you for explaining it. Is this one part of a series too, or was this more of a standalone um, project? Um, yes, this is actually a, a more um, subjective abstract piece mm. that's, um, that's a part of the, 
the collection that I'm currently working on that's focusing on the universe and uh, more spiritual things and cosmos. And so, so this is a part of that collection. And uh, that collection, that's the piece that, that has a lot of geometric shapes and those euphoric like colors in them. Yes. And so I happen to have those ones right here. So I'd love to understand more about the inspiration for it. This is called the Divine Cosmic Collective, right? Is that the name of the, the series of works? Um, yeah. So how, how did this come about? How did you decide this was what you wanted to paint about? Well, um, in my freshman year of college, um, I began to see a lot of things differently. I changed my mindset on a lot of different things. And um, so um, I began to do a lot of different research about a lot of different topics. I began study, doing a lot of studying on, uh, on my relations and different things like that. And um, how I ended up with the idea for the piece on the left side is titled uh, A Righteous Soul Transcendence. It was uh, initially a part one to a piece I created in high school. And um, it was a, it's, a, it's a second part to that piece. And that piece that um, it said it represents human consciousness and uh, the more divine form of ourselves that we find deep within. So basically it's like an, an angelic form of ourselves, our soul, a reflection of our soul, my soul, that's how I see it because I was the model for this piece. I was with, about with to say, process. it looks like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, like it's uh, my style, my piece, the staff, it represents the power of universe, solar energy, as you can see the sun. Uh, each planet, it's a different color. It represents chakras. I've done a lot of study on chakras, meditation, a lot of things for, for self-healing. I see um, different motifs. The tail represents a, like a, a black cat, black panther tail. As you can see, um, there's also a cat, a cat um, pelt around my waist. It's a, a symbol of, of tribe, tribal nature, nature. It's a, a really big theme, a part of my work. Um, the style is, is definitely inspired by Afrofuturism. As you can see as well, for, with the piece on the right side, it's a, a temple. This piece is titled Angel's Temple. It's a, this piece was intended to give the, the viewer a sense of, 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 of the artist's imagination of, of like what I see to be like a higher plane or a higher dimension of, of like a heaven place or something like that, or like a fortress or a domain for angels. And um, I wanted to give the viewer like a, a feeling of, of almost they can walk in the piece. So that's why you see the different layers and dimensions of, of, of on the piece. And uh, I really uh, spent not too, not too long creating that piece. It took about like a month for the Angel's Temple piece. The Rights and Soul piece took about, um, about three months. Um, they're both acrylic on panel board. Uh, the Rights and Soul piece is four feet by five feet. Um, the Angel's Temple is three feet by four feet. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're currently residing in Los Angeles. They're about to be shipped back to me soon, as soon as possible, because I'll be having an art show uh, starting in the fall of next year. Well, this year in the fall. Mm -hmm. So I have those back pretty soon in the art space. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, pretty much those two. That's so awesome. So these are part of the works that, um, that you sent to LA to be in a, a gallery there in some sort of public space. Is that right? Oh, yeah, correct. And um, I have actually two other pieces I'll be having on display in LA versus these two. I want to save these two right now for my private collection. They were shipped to LA though. I had them down there with me. And um, there was a change of plans on, you know, because, because of time and the people I was working with, they were very, very busy. Mm -hmm. So having these two pieces, I, you know, I just prefer to have those back in my possession, you know? Sure. I'm um I'm wondering what it was like to so you went to LA you got to see these pieces on display there is that true? Um, hold on, give me a second. No worries. Yeah, in Los Angeles, those pieces they didn't have a chance to go on display yet. I have two other pieces: Vital um, Decay of Grace and Vital Dec Decay of. Um, uh, with destruction, I believe. And yes. um, those would be the two pieces on display in, in Los Angeles. That's so cool. I It has me thinking about, you know, what it must be like for the artist, for you to see other people interact with your work and your style. Um, can you tell me what that's been like or what people, you know, talk about, what reactions you've seen? 
Um, I've seen people, you know, do a lot of different things. Uh, we have a lot of different reactions towards our work. People often want to touch it, you know, rub on it. They'll be in awe once they see it. I love those reactions because it just means that my work is, you know, is impacting them in some kind of way, some kind of deep way. And that's what I, that I love seeing that. You know, I love for people, to, I love for my work to make people think, do a lot of different thinking on a lot of different things and to make them see things in a different way. And um, people, they often um, want to buy my work when they see it. They often want commissions and different things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's always rewarding. I feel like of having a, a portfolio always on hand to show someone. For sure. Um, and I am not surprised that it makes people think. I feel like if I went, um, you know, with my family, we'd each have a different take on the two works, even that are right in front of us right here. It would spark some really good dinner conversation um, and would be very inspiring. So um, you also mentioned, so in these works, there's some elements of contemporary expressionism, elements of surrealism, elements of Afrofuturism. Um, and I can see that in the, the big picture of it, but I wondered if you could speak more about how someone could recognize these different styles at play. Like what elements are like pulling from surrealism, from Afrofuturism, stuff like that? Well, um, you can see um, surrealism, con you know, uh, components as, uh, as you look at the piece uh, on the left side, because I have, you know, big wings, there's different colors, a tail, a staff, a floating staff, you know, different things like that. It's, uh, that kind of breaks the boundaries of real life. It's create this surreal feeling. And uh, contemporary aspects come from uh, the various shapes and different colors that's, that's very standoffish, like, you know, this kind of, this abstract in a way that speaks as, a, as an abstract. Afrofuturism is a, it's, it's kind of implemented with the coloration as well. As you can see on the wings, that's the colors of the, the Pan-African flag mm -hmm. and um, the different, you know, different placement of objects. It creates that, that feeling of, of like a futuristic, like alien kind of feel, you know, as you can see on the right side as well, yeah. with the, the floating structures and different things like that, and different like windows to different dimensions, as you can say. Yes. Oh, thank you for explaining that. I feel much better equipped to go into a museum or a gallery and be like, okay, I see the surrealism here. I see the things that are happening. So that moment of art education was very useful for me. Um, this one is a, a pivot in style, right? This feels to me very different than um, the last one. Um, but this was so cool to be part of this. What is, it's like a virtual museum. Like, I, I can't wait to hear more about that experience and how it came about. Oh yeah, this is um, this piece was it was commissioned to me by the, the Delta River and Bayou's Alliance, from uh, who was uh, curated by um, Jimmy Cunningham, who's also a historian, a grant writer. He works with the city on a lot of different collaborative projects, and uh, he he done so so many different things, and he worked with me. And so this piece right here is um, a contemporary piece. It's also surreal. The approach was very very different from this one. I, I chose to work more loosely. And more, um, more kind of leaning towards the cartoonish side almost. Mm -hmm. And this piece is, is, is basically um, telling the story of runaway slaves in Arkansas. Um, it's a part of a series that exhibits, that, that tells the history of the untold in Arkansas and pile of Arkansas, like so many different moments and settings and different things were, were written and hidden where we didn't know about and kept away from history. And those same pieces of information were dug up. And then um, the historian, by the historian, Jimmy Cunningham, and he, um, he commissioned me and a few other artists to create those pieces, to, to retell that history. And this is one of those. This is a, a moment about where two slaves, they uh, snuck off at night and took horses in order to run away to free themselves. And uh, this is a one, like I mentioned, as I mentioned, this is one of many pieces. I have uh, pieces of musicians that's from Arkansas, different slaves, different uh, moments where I had one piece where as, uh, it was explained where um, Dick Grayson, a comedian, Dick Grayson, he was with uh, another well-known person. And uh, at the, the early stages of, of a restaurant down here, it was a barbecue place called Kibbs. Mm -hmm. The early structure for Kibbs, it was not known as Kibbs at the time. Well, but they were getting arrested. They both got arrested. Uh, it was a white, a white actor, I believe, or a white, political figure, I believe, that was with uh, Dick Grayson. And he ended up getting arrested for standing up for Dick Grayson because Dick Grayson was in the restaurant. And I believe um, 
with him on the wrong side. They were visiting each other for a meeting, and uh, Dick Grayson, he refused to, you know, to give up his position, so he ended up getting arrested. So, you know, it's just so many different pieces that goes into that collection. This I feel like these pieces, are, that was a part of the collection with uh, the one we're looking at now currently, those are definitely some of the more powerful, untold, unseen pieces, the undercover, you know, pieces that you have to dig up and see. And so I'm really glad that those pieces, pieces are online now on the website, on the Delta Rhythm and Bayou Alliance's web, website. Well, everyone should be able to go and see on the Explore page. Mm-hmm. It's there. It's uh, very informative. It teaches you a lot about art history as, a, as an art Kansan. and so many different things that we just don't know. You know, it was just a wonderful experience being able to, to create those pieces. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so powerful. The online museum too is just, um, it's so satisfying to be able to walk through the rooms, like with your clicker, it, it works really well. And, um, I can feel like the urgency when I look at this, um, picture even and understanding that narrative behind it too, really puts into context what's, what's happening here. Um, also that, that like purplish kind of sky really stands out to me. Like I have a, a sense from that of like what time of night it is and like just how, um, precious each moment is to to keep moving forward. Uh, so I think that's really amazing how you captured all of those different um, elements to make us feel what it could have been like in that really scary moment. So it's been so cool to get to go through some of your works and like kind of zoom in on how your style and your approach and your motivations come to life. Um, as we abstract a little bit now back to kind of the big picture, um, I'd love to understand just from your words, you know, why does art matter? What keeps inspiring and motivating you to show up and do the work that you do? Well, I feel like that's such a, a great question. <laughs> like um, art is such an important part of history. And so many people well, don't see that. And I feel like it's my purpose as an artist to create that, that narrative, that path for us as other artists, for the world to see how art really defines the culture, art shapes culture. Like you can't look up without seeing art, a piece of art, something is art. Everything is art. Like your dining room table is art. It's architecture. We had, you had a designer to plan it out, you know, scale it, create the designs and everything. Like it's so important. Like it's a, a visual representation of, of our culture, of who we are as a people. Now, you know, as Americans in general, like, it's everyone. And art is like it's in everything. It's in the, uh, it's it's what we listen to, music, mm-hmm. the way we talk, dialects, and everything. It's an art. Everything has an art behind it. So it's like the world is it's like the world is it's a big art piece that constantly creates more art itself. Like so, I, that's how I see it. You know, it's a very universal thing that really plays a vital role of our existence. And that's why I feel like as a creator. It's such an in thing for us to do because it connects us with that that source, that source of, of our creativity, like that mysterious force that we know that no one knows. Like that's just, you know, that's just that, you know. And then that that's that's where like everything great comes from. It comes from an internal place inside of us. Before it's here on the physical where we can touch it and see it and experience it, it starts within us. And that's that place where I feel like all art comes from. And that's why it's important to share with the world because it changes things, definitely. Yes, it changes things is like the best way to describe it. And I feel like that thoughtfulness of an artist, she even be able just to recognize the artfulness inside of everything. Um, what a powerful gift to be able to share that with people by whatever you outpour onto a canvas, onto a song, onto whatever it is you make um, or do. That's so cool. So what kind of, you know, lessons have you learned along the way or wisdom do you think would be helpful to share to anyone who is maybe in, um, in your space or a few steps behind where you are, um, but wants to be doing the same thing? Um, I'll say the best advice I have is to constantly keep going whatever you're doing, no matter what, no matter how you feel about it, what people say about it, or where you're currently at, your position, if you keep doing your doing what you do and constantly doing it, you'll always grow and put yourself out there, show people your work. You can't be afraid to do that because that's the only way you will network and get your art in different places and your work. And now from that point on, you will find more reason and more purpose to keep going with what you do 
especially once you start making money off of it, you'll be able to find a way that you can support yourself and your life, create a living for yourself. And you will find a lot of pleasant pleasure in doing so. It's always a gift to be able to do something like art, create that form of content because it's something a lot of people don't have. It's like almost like um like an edge you have because it's something that, that comes from you. You can just sit there and create rather than having to go somewhere and have someone tell you what to do or something like that to make money. So it's always a rewarding thing to have. So you just you should always have an appreciation for a talent or a gift or anything like that of that nature. Yeah, um, I think that's really great wisdom to to be sharing. And I thank you for doing it. And I'm thinking about, you know, there's so many um, important parts of your process of having the idea to making the work, to sharing it with the world, to then like forming a network around it and letting that lead to the next thing. Um, is there a part of that process that you like, you know, enjoy the most or look forward to the most? Maybe it's the moment when the work is done. Maybe it's the time in the studio by yourself. Maybe it's something totally different. I would say uh, the part that I enjoy the most is putting my signature on the piece to end it. <laughs> that's sick. That's so cool. <laughs> I get that. Oh, that's awesome. Just like that seal of it's done, it's accomplished. That makes sense. Um, so as we wrap up today, and it's been so fun to spend this time with you, Justin, what do you want people to leave knowing about you and your work? And what um, are you looking forward to right now? Okay, so um, i like to leave you all with this. Um, i like to leave you all with, um, let me see, um, to always dream big, follow your dreams, chase your dreams. Don't let anyone get in the way of that. Don't listen to what people tell you. If it's, if it's nothing that's supporting you or motivating you to do better. And also you can look forward to seeing my work on display on Instagram and uh, and on exhibit on April 1st, I'll be sharing the, um, the setting of where we'll be um, on the display it with Kara on Instagram online. Uh, I'll post the location of my, my artwork display that I'm working on with, with Marquee. I have an art show in the fall coming up. I'll share that online on Instagram. Uh, I have so many more different pieces on the way, so much more new content, so many different ideas. And so many different things are coming on the way. It's just, you know, Stay ready, stay on standby, always look out. And thank you all. Have a blessed day. Yes, That's thank you. Say. We will be on standby, following along. Um, and so cool the way that you are dream chasing and dream achieving and letting that be an inspiration for others. So thank you so much, Justin. This has been so much fun and so valuable. Thank you, Carl. I really appreciate this.